Hello, Tom Cowan, who is one of the well-known cinematographers and producer and directors of films, who is located here in Sydney, but has traveled worldwide, including India. And his uh, passion for uh, film spans five to six decades. And I'm very happy to say that uh, Tom has agreed to talk to me. Tom, uh, welcome to Aussie India. Thank you, Raj. Nice to be here. First, let's understand uh, your own background. Uh, we have heard about you and your films, but uh, let's hear from you how this passion started, at what age and uh, what's your background? I was born in Wangaratta in Victoria. Um, my brother, uh, who was deceased, but he had photographic material which I used to look at um, in the, uh, the wash house. Had photographic uh, developing material and uh, printing and so on and it used to fascinate me I was probably about five or six and then um, as soon as I could I got a box camera okay and then uh, Which year was it? well that was probably in uh, a, about uh, 1958 and we moved to to Melbourne, uh, where I went to high school. Well, actually, yeah, high school. And so I had this box camera. Okay. And I used to take uh, pictures of um, my friends and different things in the garden and so on. And I learned a little bit about it and I started to devour books and uh, technical things. And then we had a friend, well, people boarding with us, a Dutchman from Indonesia, had a movie camera. So when I was about 14, I suppose, I started to look at movies um, in a different way. And I realised that when I was in class uh, at school, I'd be daydreaming. And uh, I realised that daydreams were actually movies. So... What happened then was uh, one of our teachers gave us a course in history, in the history course, um, on the history of uh, an art form, which happened to be movies. So he, we started to learn about the Keystone Cops and D.W. Griffith and the early Lumiere brothers and... Um, I started devouring books from the local library about Max Sennett and so on and, um, and uh, just um, at the... F when I finished high school I was totally lucky to get a job uh, as a film trainee at the ABC in Melbourne, television. And um, by this time well, the reason that I got the job is that I had a little 8mm camera and I started making little movies with it and splicing them together and so on. And I made a, a film with my cousins who lived on a farm. They had horses and I made a, a western, mm -hmm. uh, The Great Tarwin Bank Robbery. And it was about uh, two minutes long, but it... Uh, it uh, they ride into town and they, there's, a, there's an old bank there from the 1880s or something and uh, presumably they ride out of town and the sheriff and his uh, posse ride after them. But it was uh, the same horses and the same people with different shirts. But <laughs> and then, then there's a shootout at the creek and, um, uh, and other films and I showed this at the interview with the ABC at the bosses and got the job. Um, so that was in 1960. Right. So then How old were you? Uh, I was um, just turned 18. Okay. So I was um, let loose. <laughs> well, not really, but I was allowed to or set at work in all the different departments of a television station. Of course, it was mainly film for news. 
So I would be going out with the news uh, teams and assisting, like carrying the equipment and yeah, yeah. twiddling the knobs, knobs on the film, mm -hmm. on the sound, which was optical sound. And then I would be uh, in all the different departments. Uh, so there'd be graphics, staging, uh, there's light entertainment and there's opera and ballet and there's uh, religious and there's rural and there's all the departments of the ABC. Mm -hmm. So it was like being at university in a way because there were some very, very clever people. And in Melbourne, there are a lot of people there who had escaped from Europe after the Second World War. Yes. Very creative people uh, from uh, America, England, but Hungary, Poland, Switzerland, you name it. Mm -hmm who had worked on feature films. So I was uh, avid to learn from them. And I started making films on the weekend with my friends. Okay. So I probably worked every weekend for three years on our films. Okay. And one of them, uh, I made one myself about a, a dancing class, yeah, a ballet. I was going to ask you. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And that won every award that you could win in Australia. Yes. But I'm still only 19. Right. And uh, there were no feature films in those days. Um, and so there, that sort of set me off. I could have... I was invited to go to London um, and uh, won a prize in Edinburgh. Um, but I decided not to. Uh, I wanted to make films in Australia about Australia, for Australians. Mm. Mm. Well, this film, Larry Comes in London, that's one of the films you were involved in. How that came about? Um, well, after I left the ABC, I came to the uh, Film Australia, or it, in those days it was known as the Commonwealth Film Commonwealth, Unit. Yeah. So I spent a lot of years tra training there too, uh, as a cinematographer, but still making films as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, my idea was that um, to make a film, you needed to have a camera. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the things which uh, obviously attracted a person like me, uh, coming from Bangalore mm -hmm. in India, was uh, the your name was heard when Samskara was produced and uh, as you probably know it's one of the most controversial films ever produced in Karnataka state at least mm. and uh, how did you uh, get uh, uh, how did you first of all get to India? Um, well Satyajit Ray met me in, okay. in um, Sydney he was introduced to me by David Stratton oh. Ray had come out to the film festival in 1967 mm -hmm. And then he invited me to come to India. I was very well aware of his films and I was yeah. in awe of them. Yeah. I loved his films yes. up to that point. And uh, so I'd always wanted to go to India having seen um, Patha Panchali. Mm. And I'd also been aware of India in lots of different ways mm. from reading Kim and Things mm -hmm. like that. Yes. <laughs> but uh, you met Patabi Ram Reddy. Uh, uh, introduced you? Introduced me to Patabi Ram Reddy in Madras. Mm -hmm. I came there to a party and all of these very talented people turned up at the party, right. including Girish, who was a big star. Yes. And um, Patabi said, I'm interested to talk to you about shooting the movie. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, look, <laughs> I'll just make the tea if you like. <laughs> um, I'm so interested. And um, yeah. he said, no, I mean, I'm serious. And uh, I said, well, you can get a hold of some of my films, if you like, yes. from the Australian High Commission in Delhi. Right. Because having worked for the government in Australia, they had them. Yes, OK. And then I set off and thinking that nothing would happen because there were so many film ideas around. But I, I got a call when I was in Bombay and to come back and, 
And then we started looking at the locations that oh, okay. Vasudev had chosen, mm -hmm. and uh, even helping with the casting, and also shooting a shooting script or a, really a, an adaptation of what Girish had done as a translation. Yes, that's uh, your Anantamurti's uh, novel, which uh, uh, he always uh, is known in the Kannada literature to write these controversial uh, oh. subjects. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the uh, film is uh, was so controversial; it was banned in some of the places in Karnataka, if you know, yeah. if you remember, rather. So, you have uh, been brought up in you were brought up in Australia, and how you had to stay for such a long time, making this uh, uh, help helping these movies. How was how did you adopt to staying in India, eating that food, traveling around with these people? Um, well, I think. <laughs> I, I felt quite at home in some ways. Did you? Okay. Um, you know, it's an ex-colonial country. It is, it is. <laughs> and also, um, as far as surviving, I had been on a kibbutz in, in Israel for about five months. And um, I was very healthy because I was eating the um, orthodox menu and sweating a lot in the hothouse. Oh, that's right. I was uh, <laughs> tending the roses in a hothouse. Yes. So that, uh, I was terribly, terribly, I never got sick in, in India. Okay. Well, until, uh, yeah. Um, so we were on location and in those days actually um, the rivers weren't so polluted and mm. The cities yes. weren't so That's polluted. Right. Uh, yes. Bangalore was actually a very garden city. Yes. yes. Very, very nice and um, wide streets, not crowded. Um, Madras even then was pretty good too. Mm -hmm. So um, I adapted pretty well. And, and then, then, of course, Patabi was, uh, had been to Columbia University in the United States. Yes. Uh, Girish had been to Oxford. Um, a, all, a lot of the people making the film were very educated. Like Sneha was a very, very cultured woman. Mm. Um, she was a uh, great help to me. Um, and I, I just had an instant affinity with Patabi. I felt that he was um, an extraordinary person and... Uh, we were on the, the same wavelength in many ways. We, we had seen the same films and not only had we seen the Ray films, but we'd seen European films and we... The reason that I got the job was that the cinema in Karnataka was fairly primitive and mo well, all the films were made on location. Oh, on, in the studio, right? Yeah, that's right. He didn't want that. Mm. And because of my, I had a, a long background. See, I'd actually, even though I was terribly young, I'd been shooting 35 millimeter and uh, 16 millimeter for about eight years at a high level with good training. Mm -hmm. So I was actually ready to do that. I could do the lighting and everything. How long did it take to uh, shoot? Samskara and uh, did you stay till it was completed and uh, uh, shown on the screens? No, I, well, I, I, the shooting took 30 days. Okay. We had uh, hired the crew and the equipment for 30 days. Oh, really? Okay. In those days, that's what you did mm, yeah. uh, in the South. You could actually make a film in 10 days. Yes. yes. If it was a small language. Yes like Kerala, yes. they would make their films in 10 days. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, after that you produced uh, another film called Chandamartha. Mm. That's, uh, is that something like uh, you went back to produce that movie in oh, India? Yes, yes. No, I, I left um, fairly shortly after we finished shooting. We did a uh, couple of pickups in Madras. Um, and the film was processed and edited in Madras. Uh, 
but no, I left and went went to London. Mm. But let's see, it wasn't very much later that I came back to India because I got a job for with an English film company shooting a film in Java. Okay. And then on the way back to London, we stopped in Madras. Okay. And we looked at the film, which was then banned. <laughs> <laughs> and my companion, or the, the person that was uh, directing the documentary in Java, was had won the Booker Prize. Right. That's the major English language prize in the world, I mm. suppose. Right, yeah, of course. And um, she saw the film and she wrote a great eulogy review, yeah. review of it, mm. which I think helped when the authorities were confronted with uh, a lot of pressure yeah, okay. to release the film, especially uh, the minister yes. in Delhi. Yes. So it was released and of course it was a huge, huge success. And uh, even though Patabi was ripped off by the distributor, it made a hell of a lot of money. Mm. And it won prizes all over the world. Yes. Uh, and it was shown here at the Opera House. Yeah. Probably be in the early 70s. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, do you still keep uh, those uh, links with India? Do you go back to India and uh, uh, meet some of these people? I know that uh, this uh, reliving some of the, uh, you know, um, people with whom you had the uh, uh, Tic Tac to do some Skara. I saw uh, one of those documentaries which you have produced. Yeah. We went back to the same village. Yeah, we went back to where it was shot in that uh, strict Brahmin village. Yes. Hasn't changed very much. And, uh, and we brought some of the people who'd been in the film and interviewed them on location back there and reminiscing. And uh, it's quite an interesting film about uh, the time that we made the film and how people look now in comparison <laughs> to what they looked yeah. like in 1969. Yeah, that's right. Um, now you made your foray into the giant screen, the IMAX. Oh. Antarctica was something which uh, uh, brought uh, commercial success also for you. Can you tell us a bit about that, uh, how you got involved in that? I got involved in uh, IMAX because my friend actually produced a film, Antarctica, and asked me to shoot it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's how I got involved, through my friend, through yeah. mate. Um, and that's often the way. Uh, I, um, it was terribly, terribly successful, although I'd never shot wide, wide giant screen before, but I went to Toronto to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. That's where the IMAX factory and uh, okay. headquarters was. And uh, in fact, the IMAX movement uh, was invented by an Australian. Really? So they were quite um, chuffed oh. to see me. And they okay. even had an Australian engineer, a young graduate, okay. as a sort of intern there at the factory, mm. as a tribute to the inventor. Really? Mm. Okay. Oh. And uh, you also produced uh, African Elephant Kingdom after that, which uh, is still on the giant screen IMAX. Yeah, that was a marvellous adventure as well. Uh, I was there for six months and we followed this group of elephants. And Yeah, that's a nice film. I did a lot of IMAX films because given that uh, Antarctica was so successful, the Americans assumed that I was American, you know, <laughs> they are so insular, mm, yeah. they don't realise that there are other people in the world and so uh, I got a lot of work uh, and made a lot of more money than I'd been used to making uh, by doing that. Yes. Yeah, and I, I lived in Los Angeles oh, for, two and a half years. for two and a half years. Okay. Mm. And then uh, this film, uh, Survivor 2, uh, down under to Taj. How did that come about? It's, uh... Oh, the um, why did I get that job? I'm not quite sure. I had done another sort of reality film. I was quite good 
um, at that sort of shooting as well as studio shooting. I, I don't know. I got the job, and it was quite, it was really interesting. Survivor um, a, as a as an experience, um, and it won. Well, it was nominated for an Emmy, so I went to Los Angeles again for that. I think I was there al already grading a film, but yeah, um, I've had uh, such varied experiences with um, all these films. Some of them are documentaries, some of them, um, some of them feature films. For example, I shot a feature film in Morocco, and I did one in London. Okay. And uh, then uh, I've done quite a few here, but uh, yeah, I, I've ranged around the world uh, and uh, had uh, experiences all over the place, and from Zanzibar to um, Antarctica. Mm. You've travelled all around the world, yeah. and uh, of course, the one thing that you said was uh, if you survived making films in India and didn't get sick, I think you can travel the world. <laughs> and this movie called The Orange Love Story. Mm -hmm. oh, can you tell us a bit of a background about that uh, particular film? Orange Love Story came out of uh, a, a notion or a theory that, um, that films should connect in every way that they can. In other words, um, I felt that uh, some f feature films, when when I was hired, it was because of my skill, but it wasn't because I had any real connection to that story. So I thought that um, if you could make a movie where people were uh, connected to each other, connected to their background, mm. and connected to the stories that were being told, and likewise, the rest of the crew were connected, then it should also connect to the audience. Yes. <laughs> Theoretically, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so then I thought the best idea of getting uh, a concise group or group of people would be to go to a town rather than somewhere like Bondi where of course, there's a huge number of people, but they're not really connected. Yeah. And so I chose Orange because it was uh, oh, okay. uh, just far enough away from Sydney to have mm. its own culture. Yes, yes. See, they have their own theatre, they have their own musicians, they've got a number of schools, yeah. and uh, they, they have um, all sorts of artistic endeavour as well as the uh, industry that goes on there. And mining and as well as yes. other things and there are a lot of alternative people so that was why i chose orange and uh instead of doing auditions i asked them to do tell me a love story the people who were interested to come along to the auditions just had to tell a love story and from those stories we sort of distilled an overall story that that was connected to all of the stories yes um, I, a friend of mine who was a really good writer, of, of um, a script editor and soap editor, uh, was uh, brilliant at that. And we had an acting workshop where we improvised on these stories and edited those improvisations and then edited the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we showed it in Orange and Bathurst and around the places okay. like that. Uh, and it was... Um, quite good it was it's it's a charming film it does feel very authentic and uh, it does do a lot of what I hope to do I think that if I made another three or four like along the same lines I I'd probably get it really good <laughs> yeah yeah well uh, let's come to your latest uh, which you started four years back uh, life class mm. um, is that something which, uh, uh, I mean, has been ongoing, you said, and just we were talking about it just now, uh, where, and it won an award in Los Angeles, you were telling me. Can you tell us a bit more about what it is about, this life class about, and uh, right. what attracted you to that theme? Life class is about an, an artist uh, who is um, 
a little shell-shocked. He's, the era is the Second World War. So he's come out of Europe with a digger, with a, an Australian soldier. He, they meet in Paris. He arrives in a tiny little town, right. a village in Australia, and he wants to try and give something to the town and teach art. And so he advertises life drawing classes. And that's the basis of the story. The thing is that probably the main character is a farm girl who decides that she will be the model. Okay. He's advertised for a model as well. Well, he can't get one, not in a little country town in 1920. And the whole um, brigade of wowsers and people who tut-tut are totally against this idea of um, a life drawing class. In other words, uh, uh, learning to draw from the female figure or the male figure. And so um, she's told not to do it. Mm. And being a little bit rebellious and wanting something more that, than life offers in a tiny country town, she decides that she will do it for two shillings. <laughs> no, actually, she bargains him up to three shillings okay. and then four shillings. So she's a tough nut, a real tough nut to crack, and he can't quite handle her. He's French and nothing like the models in Montparnasse <laughs> or, you know, in back in Paris. So, um, it's a comedy in a sense because the people that become involved, you know, the, the butcher and the town dressmaker and, yes. you know, that sort of... Uh, they're opposed by others in the town and uh, there's even a violent reaction and the oh he he's a especially her, her fiance come and beats him up and <coughs> um, it's to do with the effects of war the trauma of war and the healing power of art mm. that's what it's about yeah. Well, uh, I was about to say that uh, <coughs> film can be, uh, uh, the film media can be used to uh, create awareness in uh, uh, the society about various social problems. And some of your films, uh, do you think that uh, you had that in mind when you made those films or is it only if you were in the, uh, your focus was on entertainment? Mm, that's a good one. I think it... it it varied a bit. Um, with Life Class, mm -hmm. 1920, um, I definitely wanted it to be entertaining and to make people feel positive. Right. I, that's, that was one of the main aims. Of course, you know, when you're making a film, it's to telling the story and the characters and the whole choreography of it. But uh, I did want to... Uh, create a positive feeling from the film. Uh, of course, it's uh, a beautiful film, like because it's set in a very nice part of the Australian bush. Yes. Very um, attractive, and and of course, uh, <laughs> a naked woman is attractive too. Yeah. Yes, yes. And the effort to try and portray her by the artist yes. is really quite mm -hmm. engrossing. Yeah. Um, so I wanted it to be positive, um, and but when I, for example, made my first film, The Office Picnic, mm. and uh, it was uh, based on my experience in the public service uh, as a as a clerk in the public service, and uh, the sort of longing that one has for something outside, and that to some extent is supplied by the annual office picnic out in the bush. Um, um, so the story was, is about this group of people and what happens out in the bush. And uh, actually, when you think of the themes in my film, it's really a lot of it is about our experience of going out into nature. Oh, okay. you, you'll get that with life class. Yes. Yeah. Um, they go out into the bush because they can't get a haul 
it's all barred. Like the, the, the yeah. church won't let them do it. Yes, yes. And um, and Journey Among Women, which is probably yeah, that's, I was going to ask you about that film. Yeah. Yeah, it's also about a group of terrible convict women who are in jail or in the lockup, who escape and go out into the bush, and how it changes them. So there's that, and then uh, the office picnic, Journey Among Women, and Promise Woman. Yes. With um, with Orange Love Story, it's not quite as simple as that, but it's uh, there. There are there's part of the story is set out in the mm. countryside. Yeah. Um, so that's a theme that I've probably just recurs and recurs in my film. Well, um, you have uh, uh, seen the way. The uh, digital world has totally changed the way in which films are made. Mm. Uh, if uh, you compare it with uh, the times when you started making movies to what you can do now with the digital world, mm. uh, so what, uh, what do you think is the kind of effort that was required during the initial stages of your career? Mm. Well, you, one did have to learn a lot about um, film stocks and uh, and also the mechanics of the camera and so on and uh, the different ratios of lighting and which you can pretty much uh, look at in a different way with digital but you still have a lot of um, technical um, requirements and creative requirements yeah. uh, more creative and, but also technical in terms of post-production okay that when you shoot you have to be aware of how it's going to be edited yeah. and where it's going to end up. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so it might end up on the big screen or it might end up on a tiny phone, you know. Mm. it's yeah. There are different things and uh, I think it's actually a constant learning process making films. Uh, the one thing with uh, narrative films is uh, dealing with actors. I think over the years uh, in Australia the actors uh, have improved and I would say the same thing in India as mm. they become yeah. more and more trained. Now the training institutions yeah, like right. NIDA and, and in uh, Pune uh, yeah. have trained actors and you, they'll come onto a set and they won't um, eat the scenery as yeah, it were yeah, right. like they used to do. and. They were radio performance mainly when I started. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I think it's uh, the thing about dealing with actors doesn't really change all that much. It's a matter of psychology and um, how, do you, how do you get the best out of people? How do you make them freer? Uh, it's actually a lot of it in my films is about uh, freedom and responsibility if if you're making a film and everybody on the team really feels that they're making a contribution and are free to contribute uh, and that the actors are not trying to do do the right thing but they're actually just reacting in the moment and they're free to do that and they're encouraged to do that then that's the sort of film that I want to make mm -hmm. um, when we go back to Sanskara, uh, the performances are varied, of course, yes. but yeah. they had a lot of freedom because I was very much in control of the camera and yeah. allowed them. They didn't have to be stuck on one place yeah. and they, they also um, didn't get a lot of takes. Mm. Really? They had to do it, well, it was the first time, yeah. mostly. And so there's always a little bit of a spark of um, being in the moment when it's the first take. Yeah. When you do it a second time, you're trying to reproduce. It goes, it goes flat. flat. <laughs> uh, and I think that a lot of the plaudits for the acting of Samskara was because we just didn't have much time to mm. mess around. <laughs> now, uh, you have obviously won so many awards, uh, you were nominated for Emmy, 
Oh, uh, and also you talked about the Los Angeles Film Festival and various other film festivals as well for Antarctica you got the cinematography award if i ask you to put a finger on one or two couple of awards which have changed the course of your career which one they be oh undoubtedly the first one changed my career really okay. yeah winning the uh top award in the AFI awards in Australia meant that I was offered jobs yeah, and I was recognised and even that award when I came back from London, when I came back from after I'd been in Israel, Morocco and um, where else, India, I came back to Australia, I was given immediately um, funds well, I was awarded funds mm, yes. based on that, pretty much based on that first award that I won, mm. which was probably four years previous. No, six years previous. Mm. Uh, and some of the films that I'd shot subsequently, which were shown in the Sydney Film Festival, yes. but um, just uh, I was known mm, yes. because of that. Of course. Well, if I ask you, I know all films are very dear and close to the heart of uh, the, pr I mean, film producer and director and also as a cinematographer. But if I ask you which film after you have finished it and you put your feet up and see that and say, yes, I am really proud of this film, which one would you say is your proudest film? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, my proudest film... Well, I think uh, there's two. The Office Picnic, my first film, okay. look at it now and I find that it's quite remarkably strong and, and it really is uh, uh, still relevant, but it, it has, a, has an integrity to it that's um, a bit rare. Um, I, love the, I love it. It's not, an e not such an easy film. On the other hand, I really, really love Life Class 1920 okay. uh, and I'm satisfied with it. I think that it uh, does justice okay. to all the people that worked That's on it. most recent one, yeah. 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 So it's a, a 40 year difference or yeah. a 50 year difference really, 70. So what's the future for Tom Cole? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Um, got emails yesterday from India, hoping that we could get back together and do something. Um, yeah, I've, I've got quite a number of ideas uh, that are uh, sort of floating around. Uh, I'm still not quite sure that uh, I'm finished. <laughs> I'm not... Um, of course, I just bought another uh, camera that, <laughs> that could make a feature film with it. <laughs> and. Um, I've got all the post-production equipment. So I, I could make a film on my own in a way. Mm. But part of the beauty and joy of making films, uh, features that is, story films, is working with all those different people and different personalities and talents. That's um, one of the things. But I think I would really need um, a producer. I'm not going to produce another film on my own. Okay, yeah. And uh, you, would you be happy to go back to India if uh, there is an opportunity to uh, be involved in film production and uh, cinematography? Oh yes, yes. Um, we tried uh, a couple of times. We actually tried to get the rights to R.K. Narayan's The Painter of Signs, oh, okay. uh, which I like it a lot, and we did an adaptation uh, it's it's a really uh, terrific mm. story and um, it's got a lot of heart and depth to it yeah. um, and uh, an interesting era, you know, of um, uh, like child limitation, uh, like birth control, etc. Yeah. from the silly um, Gandhi boy and... Um, Mm. But it's it's the characters, as with all of Arcane Orion's, yes, they're yes. sort of 
really, really beautifully drawn and uh, palpable and um, very Indian. Yeah, it is. It is. Hmm. Yeah, Tom, uh, I'm uh, grateful for finding time to come and talk to us today and share your absolutely fascinating story. Hope you enjoyed that exclusive interview with Tom Cohen, the Australian film producer and director and cinematographer.